Ghost of Thornton Hall is a fan favorite game with people who enjoy scary stuff. That is not me. The scary stuff is amazing. It's like Game 3, which had scary moments that happen at random. Like a door slams, the ghost appears in a mirror, and there are strange whispers. The big difference is that this game had a good animation budget, so they could go all out with the hauntings and scares. The scenes of Charlotte's ghost are especially good. The environment's pretty scary, and the characters are appropriately ominous. But maybe it does too good of a job at being dark and gloomy, because I don't associate it with fun, I associate it with being dark. I'm also not a fan of the game's story, which is mainly an excuse plot so they can have scary moments. Even people who like the game agree that the ghost explanation at the end is lacking. I wish the ending had been like Scooby-Doo, where Nancy ties up the ghost and pulls off Charlotte's mask to reveal who the culprit really is. That would have been way better than Nancy had hallucinations from the furnace. The game kicks off with Nancy being woken up by a phone call from Savannah Woodham, the ghost hunter from game 23. I wish Nancy had a different phone contact in this game. Maybe John Gray from game 13, or Henry Bolet from game 17. I know it's appropriate for Savannah to be the contact, because she's a ghost hunter who is named after a city in Georgia, but I don't like her much. She was better in game 23 where she helped Nancy solve the mystery, and she happily explained how ghost hauntings are faked. Here, she's not helpful, she's just sad and scared. I have no idea why she's a ghost hunter, when all she does is complain she's scared of ghosts. Savannah has a subplot with Wade, you can go back and forth between the two of them to learn they used to date. He was madly in love with her, but she finds men with actual feelings to be more terrifying than a ghost, so she ran away without a word. I'm a romance fan, I like the story of reuniting the happy couple that was tragically separated. Still, this Savannah subplot is not as good as the one in Game 23, which included some puzzles with Logan. The other phone contacts in this game are similarly lackluster. Addison is such a scaredy-cat ghost complainer, she makes Savannah look brave. Bess and Ned are mildly entertaining, but Bess tries too hard to be silly, and even their conversations have an undercurrent of doom and gloom, which really detracts from the fun of calling them. Savannah says Jesslyn Thornton has been kidnapped. Savannah is too scared to do her job, so she asks Nancy to solve the case. The ferryman drops Nancy off at Black Rock Island, home to the eerie Thornton Hall. He warns Nancy about Wade, Harper, and Charlotte's ghost. I like to joke that the ferryman is a gossip, but I have to admit he did a much better job of preparing Nancy for the mystery than Savannah did. He told her about two of the suspects! It's the closest this game has to a case file. The scenery in this game is fantastic, it's so scary and imposing, with muted colors everywhere. This definitely feels like a dying, decaying area that's been left to rot for 20 years. As Nancy approaches Thornton Hall, she meets Colton Birchfield. I don't like Colton, he comes across as a jerk, even before you learn he's cheating on Jessalyn with his ex. Colton is Jessalyn's fiancé. Of all the characters in this game, he should be the one who's most concerned with finding her. It's actually the opposite. He doesn't try to find her, and he doesn't seem to care. He has Jesslyn's phone, but he can't be bothered to find a charger, so he dumps the job on Nancy and never follows up on it. Are you kidding me, Colton? If I found a missing person's phone, I would be running to get a new charger. I'd like to know when and how Colton found the phone. If he found it two days ago, I want to slap him for not having found a charger in all that time. If he found it two minutes ago, I still want to slap him for taking so long to find such a big clue. Like Ellie from the previous game, Colton disappears for half the game without any explanation. If he said he was gone looking for Jesslyn, that would be one thing. 
He says he goes nowhere in particular. He wanders off by himself whenever his mind goes to a dark place. Now is not the time for exploring the woods, Colton. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he went to get McDonald's for everyone, but he forgot to get some for Nancy, and now he's avoiding her because he doesn't want an awkward confrontation. In this opening conversation with Colton, he says everyone has second thoughts about getting married. Nancy asks what he means, and he says he remembers saying that. What a pointless non-answer. Specifically, he says, I remember it like it was moments ago, which is extra dumb because it was less than 30 seconds ago. My guess is that this conversation was supposed to occur on the second day of the game, but they messed it up somehow, and it shows up at the start. This is one of several conversations which feel like they're out of order. That just makes the game confusing, and it feels like sloppy editing. There are also some iffy conversations, which feel like dialogue from two unrelated conversations were thrown together. It's not as bad as game 30, for sure, but I think the conversations in this game are in major need of improvement. On the other hand, the game is going for a spooky, otherworldly vibe, so it kind of fits to have the characters talk weird. It definitely solidifies the impression that things are majorly off here at Thornton Hall. The good news is that this game finally introduces a skip button, so you can skip through all the conversations. I wish they had introduced that feature 20 games earlier, because it's so useful when you're replaying a game and don't want to hear the conversations again. I have one last complaint about Colton before moving on. His animations are weird. He's always moving his arms and body with big motions that don't complement the somber tone. It looks like he's trying to dance. Fixing Jesslyn's phone requires five items, which brings me to another complaint. It's hard to find items in this game because everywhere is so dark and the colors are desaturated. Yes, it's spooky looking, but I can't see anything. Most of the items are in the workshop on the ground floor. The items in the workshop include turpentine, a spade, a portrait, coins in a jar, nails that are retrieved with a hammer from the porch, and an apple picker that is larger than Nancy. I guess this makes three Nancy Drew games in a row where they have a bunch of items all in the same area. There are three items here that you interact with, but they don't get added to your inventory. Those are the electricity manual, a jar of wires, and a film projector. The electricity manual says what you need to get to charge the phone. The last item you need are oranges, which are part of the tea set that Clara set up in the parlor. Clara doesn't seem to notice or care that Nancy stole 12 oranges. You can also get a napkin from the tea set. I've always wondered a bit about the tea set because it seems out of place and you can zoom in on the right hand side like there's something to do there. I've seen other people suggest that maybe the game had a tea puzzle at one point, but it was removed. When you have all the items, put down the oranges. Use the coins and nails on the oranges, then use the jar of wires. Jesslyn's phone starts charging. I like doing this puzzle at the start of the game, because it takes about 15 minutes before the phone charges. Clara's in the parlor, she's Jesslyn's mother, and she runs the family business. She definitely seems like somebody who's used to being in charge. She warns you that Wade spent time in jail, and she gives you the phone number of Jesslyn's friend Addison. Addison was the last person to see Jesslyn alive, so I hope the police talk to her. Clara makes it sound like she tried calling Addison once, but Addison was too upset, so Clara gave up. What a quitter. Clara claims that everyone from the Thornton Company is searching the island right now. You just can't see them because they're invisible. At first, Clara thought Jesselyn was kidnapped for ransom, but now she's starting to think the kidnapper is punishing the Thorntons by forcing them to stay in their abandoned, cursed home and confront the sins of their past. I see our kidnapper is of the poetic justice variety. The upstairs part of Thornton Hall has Nancy's sleeping area and many portraits. The portrait you found goes in the empty frame. 
Charlotte's bedroom is the locked one at the end of the hall. Clara's portrait is right next to it, which is kind of a weird place to put the portrait. You'd think she'd put her portrait towards the front of the house, not next to the doorway that she never wants anybody to enter. Nancy notices a smudge on the portrait, which needs to be cleaned. Use the napkin from the tea set on the portrait. That makes Nancy hold the napkin in her hand. I always thought that was a little weird. Why does use napkin not mean Nancy uses the napkin? Use the turpentine on the napkin, then use the napkin on the portrait. This time it does get used on the portrait, revealing a person next to a grave. I assume she's supposed to be Jesslyn. It looks more like Deirdre Shannon from Brenda's Van Puzzle from Alibi in Ashes. They are standing at the same distance, in the same pose, in the same clothes. If you ask Clara about the painting, she says it was covered up for a reason, but she refuses to say why. It's a pretty extreme move to cut your daughter out of a painting like that, and it hardly seems worth the effort when the painting's in an abandoned house like this. Also, who has their portrait taken in a cemetery? Creepy! The cemetery is to the right of the Thornton Gates. When you first enter, Cousin Wade comes running up. Wade is probably my favorite character of the game. Of all the characters, he gives off the least amount of murder vibes. The others act like they have a hidden agenda, while Wade feels more honest. I believe he's telling the truth. When everyone else is just screwing around with Nancy. The area from Clara's portrait has two graves. One reads 54 souls. Wade is the graveyard master. He tells you stories about all the graves, including this one. Over a hundred years ago, there was a processing factory here. The Thorntons didn't build any housing, so the workers were forced to stay inside the factory. One winter night, they all died in a fire that they built to keep themselves warm. The game uses the word workers to describe the factory accident victims, but I always got the feeling they were slaves, since they processed cotton in 1800s Georgia, in a building based on Oak Alley Plantation. Maybe her interactive was forced to change all the stuff about slaves, in order to keep this game rated E for everyone. I'm honestly surprised this game is rated E. That's lower than The Silent Spy, The Captive Curse, and Shadow at the Water's Edge, which were all E10. The Thornton family was split in half over the tragedy. It's especially personal for Wade, because he went to jail after violently protesting Clara's mistreatment of her employees. Jesslyn's scavenger hunt list is near the T-shaped marker by the gate. On the list is a gravestone search. It stands out because it's indented. This is a puzzle. You have to find a letter from each grave based on the name and numbers. For example, HT56 is letter 6, word 5, on Hurium Thornton's grave. You do have to look at the graves to solve this puzzle. I got stuck once because I missed one of the nine important gravestones in the cemetery, so the game refused to accept the solution. The solution is the password to Jesslyn's phone. The phone has her text messages, and there's a humorous conversation with Clara. Every time Clara tries to write invitations, it's autocorrected to invertebrates. There are also texts from Colton, which is the only time he seems like a normal person, and Jesslyn's friend Addison. You can beat the game without calling Addison. She's too scared to be of much help. She says she and Jesslyn were doing a scavenger hunt for a bachelorette party. It was fun and silly at first, but Jesslyn became more intense and desperate as the night went on. Jesslyn especially wanted to get into Charlotte's bedroom, and Addison was terrified when Jesslyn abandoned her. The audio files on Jesslyn's phone tell a slightly different story, Jesselyn does disappear, but she comes back later in the morning, in a creepy scene where she yells at Addison to leave her alone. The audio files put a few things on your task list, including find the paper that was dropped in the floorboards. It's in the parlor. It's easy to spot since it's next to a big hole, and it's a different color from the other floorboards. Convenient. When you look at it, there's a spider jump scare. Eek! The paper is a two-page puzzle, and please don't ask where Jesslyn got it from, because we'll never find out.
I like this puzzle a lot. You have to move your token all over the board to spell out a color while ending at the bottom. The answer is yellow. On the second page, you want to go through every single yellow tile. That spells out Ethel's Grave, a puzzle for much later on. After you first talk to Wade, Savannah's package for Nancy appears upstairs. I don't understand the logic behind that. Maybe Clara refuses to put out the mail, unless Wade is distracted. Inside, Nancy finds an EMF reader in Savannah's book, which has some statements from people claiming they saw Charlotte's ghost. These are surprisingly dull. I would have included much scarier ghost stories. A haunting picture of Charlotte in her masquerade costume is on the book's cover. Nancy then sees Charlotte's ghost in the hallway. Charlotte walks towards Nancy and fades into nothingness before she gets close. The next time Nancy enters the house, she hears eerie singing from upstairs. Nancy finds a strange note for her there. It says to meet with Charlotte, Nancy needs to make herself blind and say Charlotte's rhyme in the place where the EMF reader peaks. Good thing Nancy just got an EMF reader a moment ago from an unexpected package, or else this puzzle would be impossible to solve. Wade tells Nancy the rhyme used to summon Charlotte's ghost. Fire so red, night so black, dear sweet Charlotte, please come back. Ooh, I love it. That is a scary good ghost rhyme. I kind of want to write it on the walls of the garage before I sell my house just to mess with the new owners. Use the EMF on the old door in the workshop to see it's the scariest place here. If you try opening this door by yourself, there's a death scene where Nancy is killed by a Sith. Nancy has to get a second napkin to use as a blindfold. To use it, just click the napkin in your inventory. Nancy automatically blindfolds herself. I love how Nancy has joke rhymes that insult the Thorntons. It's funny to see her not take this situation seriously. If you pick one of those joke dialogue options, Nancy's killed by the Sith. So I guess Charlotte's ghost doesn't have much of a sense of humor. An unknown person leads Nancy away, demanding to know why she should let Nancy live. I like Nancy's dialogue options here too. She refuses to let herself be pushed around by a stranger. The stranger reveals herself as Harper, and I really do wish the game had explained who Harper is before this scene. It's more impactful when you know Harper is Charlotte's long-lost sister. I think Harper is the most popular character of the game because she's funny in a dark and twisted way. She's the only character who is having a good time here. She seems to enjoy making people think she's unbalanced and dangerous. Spending all her time next to the hallucination-inducing furnace isn't doing her sanity any favors either. She's living in the basement because she wants to avoid her family members. She hates them because they think she's a freak. Harper jokes about killing children, gives Nancy another puzzle to solve, then sends Nancy on her merry little way without a word. Okay, I take back what I said just now. Nancy does let herself get pushed around by a stranger. Harper's new puzzle says to look to the portraits. Nancy has to use her turpentine napkin on seven different portraits inside this building. Each one has a number and some letters. Nancy automatically fills them in on the puzzle paper. I wonder why she did that for this puzzle and not the gravestone search puzzle. I also wonder why there are letters on these old portraits in the first place. I suspect Harper didn't mind defacing her ancestors' portraits for the sake of a good anagram. Nancy moves the letters around to spell out cotton gin, get seeds, balance scales. A bag of cotton awaits on the blue dresser upstairs. The cotton gin is in the workshop, but to use it, Nancy has to put seven combs on in the correct order. I think this puzzle is okay, but I'd like it better if it came with an explanation of what you're supposed to do. I have no idea what the plastic tubes are. It's easy enough to solve the puzzle by brute force, since you know right away when you get a piece wrong. Use the cotton bag on the fixed cotton gin for seeds. To the right of the scary door is a scale. Use the seeds on the scale. It's a math puzzle. You have to put all the seeds on the scale while getting both sides to balance perfectly. 
This raises the door for the rest of the game, revealing the tunnel to the basement. Inside the tunnel is Jesslyn's backpack, which should be a big clue Nancy can talk to the other characters about. Even just opening up the basement should be a big deal. People should search every inch of that place. The closest we get is Nancy telling Clara that a strange woman's in the basement. When Clara sees nothing but the furnace, she yells at Nancy for playing games with her. I find it weird that Wade is part of this scene. Where did he come from? And why doesn't he say anything? Inside Jesslyn's backpack is a Coco Kringle bar, a Thornton family tree, half of the key to Charlotte's bedroom, and a letter from Jesslyn to Colton, listing all of her mom's various wedding demands. Colton wrote sarcastic responses all over the page. I don't think the basement is supposed to be confusing, but it confuses me. I have trouble finding things here especially during the final wheelbarrow challenge. There's Harper, a door locked by a math puzzle, two secret puzzles, and I could swear the final thing is a sealed door, but it never becomes important. There is a paper, which is mostly Harper complaining she dislikes the phrase, Dead men tell no tales. The paper says Charlotte had a cryptic obsession with her grandfather. Some people have taken this to mean that Jackson did something terribly twisted and evil. I don't think you can conclude that from this paper alone. It's just as plausible to say Charlotte stole Jackson's secret recipe for fried chicken, and Harper is purposely messing with everyone by giving Nancy fake clues. That's why Harper tells Nancy to look into Clara's father as a potential suspect. Not only does that waste Nancy's time with a dead end, but it really upsets Clara. Clara angrily admits that she doesn't know who her father is. Clara's mother took that secret to her grave when Clara was a young child. We never learn who Clara's father is. My guess is Dr. Gilbert Buford from Game 17. Rosalie kept it a secret because she thought her family would disown her for having a relationship with a black man. The Thorns are so judgmental that there's no shortage of men they disapprove of. I could see them rejecting anyone who's too poor or not high class enough for them. Harper leaves another singing note for Nancy. This is a simple logic puzzle to determine what order to press glass bottles in. I like this puzzle okay. Don't forget to grab the glass tiles while you solve the puzzle. Nancy finds a passage leading to somewhere. It seems to be a crawl space under the porch, but it can't be, because Nancy arrived by going in the opposite direction. She overhears Colton on the phone, complaining about the way Lexi left him. More on that in a moment. In this area, Nancy finds Jesslyn's pink camera, which has several photos that Nancy must investigate. I like how we have four new things to investigate, but sadly it's just an illusion of freedom because three of the puzzles are closed off at the moment, leaving you no choice but to find the ruins first. When leaving the area, Nancy's vision blurs and changes color as she wobbles. It looks like she passes out, but she wakes up in her sleeping area. So I guess she pulled through long enough to reach her sleeping bag, or a Harper dragged Nancy upstairs. Day two starts with Nancy on the phone with her friends, she rudely hangs up on them to read Harper's new singing note. It's a double puzzle, which shows how to get the flower sketch and where to use the bird plate. I think the developers messed up on this puzzle. The hint in the task list says this is a picture for the flower plate, but it's not. It's a picture for the bird plate. As a result of this mistake, there is no clue to indicate where the flower plate goes. When Nancy first leaves the house, she overhears Colton talking to Lexi. Colton says he knows she cares for him, and he insists on seeing her when this is all over. Nancy's none-too-bright comment is, He's talking to Lexi! Colton doesn't want to talk about it, but Nancy insists. Colton says Lexi is his ex-girlfriend. He loves her and wants to spend his life with her. Colton just learned his parents and Clara bribed Lexi into breaking up with him so they could pressure him into marrying Jesselyn instead. Colton assumes Jesselyn was in on this plan. 
I know Colton's in a bad situation, but I have no sympathy for him. He should have been looking for his kidnapped fiance instead of trying to get back with his ex. In Colton's defense, we don't know for sure he was trying to get back with Lexi. It's possible she called him out of the blue and confessed, only she has terrible timing. The conversation ends with Colton saying he came here to forget something. Nancy asks what, and he says, I guess it must have worked. What a pointless non-answer. According to Jesslyn's camera, the T-marker hides the path to the ruins where Charlotte died. The ruins sure are creepy. On the fountain is a puzzle. You're supposed to get instructions from Wade, but you don't have to. I really like this puzzle. It's my favorite one of the game. You need to make the red and blue tiles appear in the correct spots. Two tiles of the same color can't touch. The interface for this is fantastic. If you make an impossible move, the outline of the bad pieces change to let you know where the problem is. Not to mention, the numbers on the outside automatically get crossed off when they're correct. I wish that happened with the nonograms puzzle in game 23. Solving the puzzle gets you the snake plate and the paper that opens Charlotte's locket. I wonder who left those items here. Presumably Charlotte hid the paper for the locket, but I doubt she hid the plate because that leads to half of her room key and her room was sealed off after she died. Inside the building, Nancy sees Charlotte's ghost descending the stairs while the haunting ladybug song plays. Nancy says, that wasn't just my imagination. Which is ironic, because the ending of the game says, <laughs> It totally was your imagination the whole time! I like to think Charlotte's ghost is real in this scene, and she's helpfully showing Nancy where the crypt key is. It's at the bottom of the stairs. Nancy uses the apple picker to get it. Nancy also gets a film reel on a table here. You play it on the film projector in the workshop. It's a video of Charlotte's birthday, which only shows a table with presents, Probably because it would be too expensive to show a room full of characters. Whoever made this video is better at video editing than I am, because they altered the video with images of a star in the ruins. Clara walks in on the video. She forces Nancy to turn it off. When you return to the ruins, there's a scary scene where Charlotte's ghost approaches you and burns up into nothingness. Nancy passes out and wakes up disoriented. Again, this game is rated E for everyone. The star is above broken floorboards. You have to do the stacking puzzle from Alibi and Ashes to reach the star at the top of the screen. Nancy does a quick sketch of the star, and the ceiling starts to fall down. You have to back away to avoid being crushed. Underneath the star is a riddle saying where the star plate goes, the same is true of the snake sketch on a pillar, which is one of the pictures in Jessalyn's phone. I find it annoying that Nancy copies the two sketches, but she doesn't copy the riddles that go with them. The crypt key opens the crypt in the graveyard. Harper enters through a side tunnel and gets mad at you. I'm not sure why they included this brief Harper scene. She doesn't have anything interesting or important to say. Harper prevents you from solving puzzles in the crypt. Which is weird, because she left Nancy a singing note with a crypt puzzle. Does she not want Nancy to solve that puzzle? Get rid of Harper by saying something mean to her. Or by leaving. When she's gone, you can take the flower from the back wall. Harper's new singing note says to place a flower on the statue of Charlotte outside. The next time you visit the statue, the flower's replaced with a flower sketch. I wonder how Harper left the sketch there without Wade seeing her. The bird sketch is on the right side of the crypt, near a newspaper about Charlotte's funeral. Harper had a violent outburst at the funeral. She had to be restrained by the police. The bird plate is already on the correct coffin. Zoom in on it for a tangrams puzzle, which we've seen in a few other games. You want to rotate the pieces and put them in place to make the picture. Good thing Nancy's sketches are the perfect size to fit these plates. Solving the puzzle opens up the coffin, giving you numbers for Charlotte's door. The star plate is on the wrong coffin. Move it to the correct coffin, according to the riddle, and open it for Charlotte's locket. 
place the snake plate according to the riddle and solve it for half the key to Charlotte's room. Minor complaint, if a key is broken in half, you can't just use it like a normal key. At the very least, you'd have to glue or tape the broken pieces back together. Jesselyn's audio diary says to check the crypt window. It's a puzzle to move the various panes of glass so the colors match each other. It's an okay puzzle. When you solve it, it spells out Beauregard. This is Nancy's clue to deface Beauregard's tombstone. She uncovers colored tiles along the bottom. Harper leaves another singing message for Nancy. It says to go through a hidden tunnel. Jessla's camera shows it's behind some barrels. Nancy has great timing because she uses the tunnel at the exact same time Wade sneaks into the house. She sees him trying to enter Charlotte's room. Something scares Wade and he runs away, dropping the clock key. Maybe Wade was scared by the puzzle on the door. It's another variation of the fountain tile puzzle. I liked it so much, I don't mind doing it again. It's fun. I think Charlotte's room is a little underwhelming, considering how much it was built up. There's a writing desk with Charlotte's journal. She expresses concerns for Harper's sanity, and she writes the rules for the number puzzle in the basement. The bottom of Charlotte's jewelry box is a tile puzzle. Place the basement tiles here, and press the tiles following the sequence on Beauregard's tombstone. I like this puzzle. Solving it gives you a note about the clocks. It says you want all five clocks to reach midnight at the same time. Use Wade's clock key to start the puzzle. The clocks move at three different speeds, which makes it hard to sync them up. I think it's a good puzzle, but based on the comments I've read, players really hate this puzzle. Solving the clock puzzle reveals a hidden passageway behind a large portrait. The passage leads to the parlor, where Nancy overhears Clara calling Colton's parents. She demands that they fix the mess with Lexi that they created. Unless I'm wrong, you can't talk to Clara or Colton about this phone call. That's disappointing. Charlotte's jewelry box has an invitation for her fatal masquerade party, along with a key for the Ethel's Grave puzzle. Jessalyn's phone shows the dirt where the puzzle's hidden. Dig it up with the spade and unlock it with the key. As the paper from the floorboards indicates, you want to click the left and right buttons here until you write out the number on Ethel's grave. I think it's an interesting puzzle, but it's too hard for me. Master Sleuth makes it harder by adding a number 4 to the date. That's right, Ethel dies on a different date in Master Sleuth mode. That's the benefit of being a Master Sleuth. You live longer. Solving the puzzle gets Nancy the flower plate. She passes out again. Nancy should be a good enough detective to realize, gee, she keeps passing out in this one area. Maybe it's dangerous. As I complained earlier, there's no clue to indicate where the flower plate goes. If you use it on the place from Harper's flower note, it doesn't work. It's actually two places right of that spot. Open the flower coffin for a number six button, which goes on the basement door. Rearrange the numbers so they match the instructions in Charlotte's notebook. Once you solve the puzzle, the door opens and Nancy finds Jessalyn. Nancy introduces herself. She says Wade hired her to find Jessalyn. Jessalyn is distressed to hear this and asks what is wrong with her family. That's a weird response. Why does she think it's wrong for Wade to want to find a kidnapped relative? Jessalyn does not want to be found, and she orders Nancy to keep her secret. There's a game over sequence if you threaten to tell the others. Jessalyn says the Charlotte ghost rhyme. The ghost shows up and kills Nancy. Jessalyn has no remorse. She goes so far as to blame Nancy, saying this is your fault. It's a terrible first impression for Jessalyn to murder a stranger like that. A lot of people have complained about this scene because the ghost isn't real. How did it kill Nancy? The most common argument is that Nancy died from shock because she thinks the ghost is real. If thinking about something makes it real, I'm going to think about winning the lottery. The second most common argument I saw is that it's a game over scene, not because Nancy is dead, but because the case is over. 
I would believe that if the game over screen did not say you have made a fatal error. That makes it pretty clear Nancy is dead. To avoid dying, Nancy must agree to help Jesselyn. Jesselyn starts to explain what happened, but she's interrupted by Harper. Jesselyn says, ignore her for a second, come here. Like she's taking Nancy someplace else? But nobody moves anywhere. Jesselyn says Harper caught her on the night of the scavenger hunt. They talked for the first time ever. Harper convinced Jesselyn that Claire is the one who killed Charlotte. I know I've complained a lot in this video, but I need way more explanation than that. Why did Jesselyn fake her own kidnapping? How do you go from my mother as a killer to I'm going to kidnap myself? How does a fake kidnapping do anything to expose the killer? What does Jesselyn hope to gain from hiding in a tunnel for days? I think we can blame Harper for the bad plan. Harper seems to think that if she torments Clara enough, it will guilt Clara into confessing. The phone calls with Bess indicate Harper went so far as to disguise herself as Charlotte's ghost, which is pretty extreme. Whatever the fake kidnapping plan was, it hasn't worked so far. Jesselyn says they're running out of time. They need proof that Claire is guilty. Search for proof should have been the first plan, not the backup plan. Clara keeps Charlotte's locket inside her briefcase at all times. Jesselyn has instructions on how to open the briefcase. I take back what I just said. Getting the incriminating evidence should have been the first plan for proving Clara's guilt. You could talk to Jesselyn about Colton, but she doesn't have much to say. She wants to break up with Colton so he can date Lexi again. That's exactly what happens in the good ending. To get Clara's briefcase, you have to enter the parlor through the hidden passageway in Charlotte's room. Harper lures Clara out of the room with ghostly singing. The briefcase puzzle is fine. You have to follow simple clues, like if Cornelia died in 1924, press piece 4, if not, press piece 6. I usually cheat on this puzzle because I don't feel like backtracking over the entire game to figure out the clues. As Jesselyn said, Clara keeps Charlotte's necklace in the briefcase. Give the necklace to Jesselyn. She says it opens with the locket piece, which you got from the star puzzle. You open it by entering the correct three names from the fountain puzzle. According to the family tree, those names are Mariana, Hiriam, and Emmeline. Enter those names on the locket to find Charlotte's note. Nancy asks what the note says. Jesselyn is a bit of a drama queen, so she says, I can't! Then she runs away to confront Clara. I wish we could have seen that confrontation. In the ending, Jesselyn knows Claire is in Charlotte's room, so I think we can assume the confrontation took place there. Nancy takes Charlotte's note, which has instructions for opening her hidden safe. To find the safe, you have to talk to Colton. Without any prompting from Nancy, Colton confesses he saw Charlotte by the crypt the night she died. She gave him the paper with the safe's location. Why did she give this to a random kid? instead of a trusted relative like Wade. I don't know. Nancy and Colton both say he was a kid when this happened. I would really like to know his exact age. If he was quite young, I don't know what Charlotte was thinking. If he was older, then it's creepy he's engaged to Jesselyn, who was born the year Charlotte died. Colton's paper has the same mirrored number puzzle from White Wolf of Icicle Creek. The answer is the number six next to a backward six, that symbol is in Jesselyn's tunnel, but it's dark. To light up the tunnel, you must solve a generator puzzle. In the basement corner, I like this puzzle! You have to move the ball bearing through the maze to open the lid on top, then you have to do the puzzle in reverse. It's neat! I wish we had another variation of the puzzle. With the tunnels lit, use the spade on the correct symbol to find a hidden wall safe. It's locked with a slider puzzle, everyone's favorite! This one is extra tough, because unlike most slider puzzles, you're not trying to form a picture. You need to move all the pieces around so they match the levers on the outsides of the puzzle. It's tricky, because there are multiple pieces with identical sides. You have to figure out which one goes where, on top of the challenge of simply getting the pieces into the right spots. 
You can use the levers to lock a piece into place, which kind of helps. Once all the tiles are in place, you have to push the levers according to Charlotte's note. The safe opens, revealing why Clara killed Charlotte. The day before she died, Charlotte changed her will, so everything went to Harper, not Clara. The will was signed by two witnesses, and I'd really like to know why neither of them came forward after Charlotte's death. I'd also like to know why Charlotte secretly changed her will. She must have had a strong motive to do so, right? We never find out, do we? Well, that's kind of disappointing. A fire starts suddenly. Nancy returns to the basement, where Jessalyn says Harper's in bad shape. Nancy has the option to escape on her own, leaving them behind. This leads to the bad ending, where Jessalyn and Harper are hospitalized, Clara isn't found, and Nancy can't contact Wade or Colton for an update. Nancy can choose to save Harper. If I was Nancy, I would help Jessalyn carry Harper outside. Instead, Jessalyn stands around and does nothing, while Nancy searches the room for random objects. She finds four things and uses them on a cart to make a wheelbarrow. Realistically speaking, this should be a time challenge. If you don't solve it in time, everyone dies. They probably didn't do that because the game has enough endings as it is. Jessalyn says Clara is in Charlotte's bedroom, but getting her out would be too dangerous. Jessalyn asks you to decide. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that sounds an awful lot like Jessalyn is asking a stranger to risk her life doing something that Jessalyn is unwilling to do herself. If you decide to leave the burning house, it's another bad ending. Nancy, Jessalyn, and Harper get out of the house okay. Clara is not found. Her ghost is seen with Charlotte's, indicating she died in the fire. The fire department finds that the basement furnace is to blame for the fire, as well as carbon monoxide poisoning, which caused all of the ghostly hallucinations. Some people think that's a rational explanation. To me, it feels more like an excuse, a last-minute attempt to hand-wave the entire game. I like the ghost stuff, it's really cool and scary, but I would prefer a better explanation. Nancy goes to Charlotte's room. Instead of helping, Clara stands in place and does nothing. I see where Jessalyn gets it from. Clara yells at Charlotte's ghost for wanting revenge. I sat by your grave for a year! Isn't that enough? No, Clara. You stole Charlotte's company, all of her possessions, and wrecked Harper's life to cover it up. You did not do much atonement. Nancy has to solve the clock puzzle again, only it's a different solution because the clocks are running at different speeds now. I don't know how the puzzle got reset. Clara says she deserves to die in the fire, but Nancy forces her to leave. This is the good ending! Clara confesses she started the fire to punish Charlotte for disinheriting her. Clara claims she only wanted to scare Charlotte, she didn't want to kill Charlotte, but the fire spread way too quickly. Wade patches things up with Savannah, and Jesslyn gets control of the company. You may disagree, but Claire is a murderer. I think she deserves more punishment than being forced into early retirement. Harper tries to disappear, but the Thorntons convince her to rejoin the family. At Harper's suggestion, the island is converted into a park, dedicated to the memory of everyone who died there. It'll be a great park, except for the cemetery and the creepy-looking trees. I like how this game has multiple endings, including a dark ending that suits the tone of the game. I don't like how the endings punish you for not risking your life to save everyone. Don't listen to this game. If you're ever in a burning house in real life, leaving is the smart and safe thing to do. Overall, I'd say it's a good game, especially if you like scary games. I think the dialogue needs a rewrite, which could smooth out some of the plot issues. If scary games were my thing, I'd love this one to death. I can see why it's a fan favorite of the Scary Games group. My score for this game is an 8 out of 10.